We often take for granted the fact that we live at the bottom, effectively, of an ocean of atmosphere that's extending above our heads way beyond the internationally accepted boundary of space, which is 100 kilometres. And it's the weight of that atmosphere above us, pushing down, that creates the phenomena of air pressure, coupled with the behaviour of air molecules themselves. Although we may not think about it every day, we have trillions of air molecules moving at colossally high speeds, banging into things, bouncing off, imparting changes of momentum, and all of these coupled together give us the phenomena that we think of as air pressure. Now, within GCSE separate sciences, we do need to go as far as understanding quantitatively about kinetic theory of gases, but also some of the gas laws. And I want to show a couple of demonstrations that normally we would do as a demonstration with students, but we can get students to do themselves. And they involve nothing more complicated than a syringe, a marshmallow, and some hot water here. In terms of the numbers and what we think of as being sea level atmospheric pressure, the value that meteorologists always use, now they measure in millibars, but as physicists we measure in pascals. One pascal is a force of one newton spread out over an area of one metre squared. And there are all sorts of practicals we can do involving pushing pencils into your hands, etc. When we think about the numbers at sea level, standard atmospheric pressure is regarded as 101,325 pascals. And what that effectively means is that on every square metre of the Earth's surface like this, there is a column of atmosphere above us that has a weight of 10 tons pushing down on us. And the only reason that we don't notice this effect and we're squashed by this pressure is of course that we are internally pressurised with liquids and gases pushing outwards. It's when we start to get pressure differences that we start to see some quite spectacular effects. So what we're going to do is instead of using the classic vacuum jar and a, a, a vacuum pump as well and gathering everyone around, we'll give students, every student, a syringe. And this is going to be our pressure vessel that we use. Just normal medical syringes here, very easy to obtain. Now, if I train this in, and Sophie, can we see it quite clearly here? Okay, at the moment, we've got gas inside the syringe, we've got gas outside the syringe, and of course, the gas inside can exchange with the gas outside through this nozzle. Remember, the gas molecules themselves are moving at a variety of speeds, but these could be up to three, four hundred metres per second. Now, at the moment, the gases are free to exchange through this nozzle, but the moment I seal off the nozzle, what I have here is a closed system, and that system is characterised by having a certain pressure, a certain volume within which the gas molecules can collide, it's got a certain temperature, which is a measure of the kinetic energy of the particles, and of course there's a certain number of gas molecules in there. And all of those are linked, and we have the familiar PV equals NRT, where N is the number of moles of gas, R is the molar gas co constant. When I'm thinking on a microscopic scale of what's going on at a molecular level, I prefer using the version PV equals NKT, where N is the absolute number of molecules and K is Bolt Boltzmann's constant. As far as the gas is concerned though, it doesn't care how we're modelling it with molar gas constants or Boltzmann's constants. The molecules are just doing their own thing. Now at the moment, I'm going to seal off the gas and it's reading three millilitres on here. Now, if I consider the gas equation P times V is constant, what this means is if I triple the volume to move out to 9 millilitres, the internal pressure now is a third of what it was when the plunger was at 3 millilitres. So just by pulling the plunger out, and remember I'm keeping my finger on there, I've effectively taken us from sea level atmospheric pressure to the summit of Mount Everest, because at 8,850 metres above sea level, the air pressure is about a third of what it is at sea level. So now, the pressure environment inside, going from here to here, is the same as it would be on the summit of Mount Everest. Of course, if I let go of the plunger, the plunger itself will move back inwards, and we can get students to start thinking about why, of course, it's the pressure differential between outside and inside that will drive this towards equilibrium. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take out the plunger and we're going to put our test subject, our test astronaut, into the pressure chamber 
and we're going to reinsert the plunger. Now I make sure that I do it so that it is touching the marshmallow but not squishing it completely. Once again we've got an open system here, I'm now going to close it off so we've got a marshmallow, our test astronaut, in a system at sea level. And what we're going to now do is we're going to pull the plunger out, so we're going to take our test subject to a higher and higher altitude. The external pressure surrounding our test subject will get less and less and less, but of course our test subject has got gases inside that are pretty much at sea level pressure. Let's look at the effect. Sophie, can we see this quite clearly? Okay, so as I pull the plunger out, and you can see quite dramatically, our marshmallow is expanding. And that expansion is due to a pressure difference between the gases inside and outside. If I let the pressure get higher again by pushing the plunger back in, of course the marshmallow will, will shrink. And if we're feeling particularly evil, we can put our test subject through various cycles of torture here, taking them to the top of Mount Everest and bringing them back again. I'm just going to start from an even, or I'm going to go to an even lower pressure. I'm going to start from about two millilitres here. And if I now go to a fifth of atmospheric pressure, we can see that swelling quite dramatically. Of course, as soon as I let the gas back in again, Sophie, is the camera on there? Okay, so if I let the gas back in, we can see very dramatically how quickly the marshmallow shrinks as it tries to get to an equilibrium state when the air rushes back in and equalises the pressure. That is a very simple but dramatic demonstration of one of the ideal gas laws. But just something to think about, if I just repeat the experiment, what I tend to find is these marshmallows can go through several cycles, but the skin does start to break up, etc. Of course, with the students, all I, I tell them is you don't know whose grubby paws have been on these marshmallows before, so they never tend to eat them. But it's something to think about if it comes down to space exploration, because I said going from three to nine will take us from the surface of Earth to the summit of Mount Everest. If I wanted to replicate this and try and do an experiment to recreate the Martian environment, I wouldn't need to go from 3 to 9. I wouldn't need to have a syringe going from 3 to 30. I'd need to have a syringe that would extend from 3 millilitres to about 450 millilitres. So roughly speaking, I would need a syringe longer than my arm width here because the surface pressure on Mars is about 1 150th what it is on the surface of the Earth. Don't be misled by these pictures that the surface of Mars looks like the Atacama Desert in South America. Looks are deceiving because if you were to stand on the surface of Mars without a pressure suit, you'd have explosive outgassing of the air from your lungs and you can do the calculations. There'd probably be enough force to blow some of your looser teeth out, but there's an even more insidious effect that we're going to look at for our second demonstration.